tomorrow again I'll be at lunch in the uh, Upala cafeteria at 12.30 if anyone wants to connect. I think that'll be my last time because I have uh, some other obligations after that and I leave on Saturday. Back to the United States. So I'll be sad to leave. It's really been great to be with you all. So what to do about that sadness? Should I get caught up in it? Should I reject it? Should I suppress it, deny it, avoid it? And that's actually uh, at the heart of what we're doing here is learning how to become aware of feelings in a deeply accepting way that is neither caught up in them nor rejecting them, nor denying them, nor attempting to change them in any way. When we become present to feelings in that way, what way? What way? Anybody? Yeah, thank you. Just I, I, please don't try not to be intimidated. <laughs> I just want to see if we're on, you know, if we're following along as we're going. So to become aware of whatever we're feeling and wh whenever we're feeling some kind of an emotional feeling, so we're worried or anxiety or upset or sad or angry, um, whatever it is. Then there's a part of ourself that's also present that is a sense of self that has arisen together with that pattern of thought and feeling. So we can become aware of what sense of self is here now. Sad self, angry self, controlling self, doubting self, anxious self, terrified self, freaking out self, happy self, very compassionate self. So I'm really doing well. I'm really being compassionate. That's also a sense of self that the mind is now caught up in in the name of virtue. Whatever the feeling is, the emotional feeling, and basically we're, we're almost always feeling some kind of an emotional feeling, unless we're settled in some, you know, very calm way. Otherwise, we're cycling through emotional feelings. So we can notice there's a sense of self with it, which I also I'm calling a part of us, a part, a sense of self, a pattern of thought, and generally our habit is, and this is part of the second noble truth, inner causes of suffering, the habit of our mind is to be completely sucked into and totally identified with that sense of self and what it's feeling. And what we're trying to learn here, and really through all our practices and studies, because feelings are kind of the, the key, or feelings are the heart of samsara, our reactions to what we're feeling are what either maintain samsara or free us from it. So this is an important thing we're learning here. So if we can become actually conscious and aware of whatever the feeling is and the sense of self that's arisen with that feeling, the very moment that we become conscious and aware of it, we're no longer totally identified with it. But I want to go further, not just conscious and aware of the sense of self and its feeling in a cold, detached way, but in a, a warm way, a way that is gently welcoming it, aware of it in a deeply accepting way, deeply allowing it. That is what our minds have not been doing. Either our minds are just completely identified with it. So when I ask, when I ask, well, what difficulties we've we been having with the meditation, naturally the way we share is, well, I started thinking about this and that, and then I had doubts about this, and I was afraid of that. Then I started grieving about the fact that I've lost the person who was the caring moment person, and on and on and on. All these are feelings. But notice how it's I did this and I did that and I did that. 
which means the mind's completely identified with the sense of self that's there with the feeling. But our mind does not have to be completely identified, not at all. It doesn't have to be. It just feels like it has to be because the habit is so strong. But we can actually learn, you know, a different habit in a sense. Initially, it's a different habit and eventually it becomes a deconditioning, freedom from habits. So what would the new habit be? It would be learning to notice what we're feeling, notice the sense of self with it, and welcome it. Deeply allow it to be here with a gentle sense of welcoming it. But notice even the way I'm speaking, the mind is no longer fully identified with it. We are now inhabiting a larger awareness that is welcoming the feeling and the sense of self with it. We are no longer completely identified with it. And that, in the system that I'm sort of speaking from, the language I'm using, that is called unblending. Learning how the mind can unblend from its usual identification with the sense of self and feeling of the moment. Unblending. How to unblend, which means how to disidentify. It's just that disidentify sounds colder. Sounds to me a little judgmental. But anyhow, technically it's accurate. So how to disidentify, how to unblend, how? from the sense of self and the feeling that's it's not again I'm not talking about rejecting denying suppressing avoiding attempting to get rid of but how can we disidentify with unblend from the sense of self and its feeling that normally completely sucks the mind totally into oneness with it how can the mind be freed from that? What do we do? Anybody? So become aware of it in a deeply accepting way, even a gently welcoming way. And notice already the way I'm talking, my mind being present to it in that way is no longer completely identified with it. It can't be because it's welcoming it. If you're welcoming someone, you are not some, that someone. You're welcoming that someone. Is that sort of clear? It may not be completely clear because we have to learn experientially. But to help with that, we can, again, I want to kind of repeat the basic practice of engaging the receptive mode. And then from there tonight, I'm going to try to use the time in a way that helps permits us to go into the second mode, which is called deepening mode. The receptive mode involves finding an access point to the qualities of the nature of mind, qualities of our fundamental awareness. Qualities like love, warmth, acceptance, care, equanimity, compassion, responsiveness, courage. Those are qualities of the deep nature of our mind. So the receptive mode involves finding an access point to those qualities with immediacy. Bang, they're here. Well, how could they be here so fast? Because they are innate. They are capacities of our basic awareness that are already available here right now, always, but are being held back, obstructed, impeded by the habits of our minds, identifying with senses of self and reacting from there, obstructs these capacities. Is that clear? I'm basically speaking now from Nyingma Kagyu tradition, which shares in the ways I'm speaking also with Zen traditions, many of them. Not just that, but also with pure land traditions. And Mahayana. So first, the receptive mode involves finding an access point. How do we do that? Well, one way is to bring to mind a spiritual field, 
like bring to mind a, f a whole field of like a refuge field in Buddhist training. You bring to mind the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas and so forth. But that will only be an access point to qualities of love, compassion, and so forth. That is the felt sense or experience that you are held in those qualities by all the Buddhists and Bodhisattvas. That'll only be an access point if it is. If it is. If your experience of bringing to mind uh, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, or your teacher, or lineage teachers, if that has a felt sense to it, that you are held in their protection, meaning you are held in the unconditional and unconditioned qualities of love, compassion, discernment, wisdom, seeing you in the depth of your being, upholding your best possibilities until you are fully awakened and they will not let go of you. They will never let go of you because that is their vow. That was their bodhisattva vow and they're not messing around. That's the felt sense of a refuge field. So some of us may have that kind of felt sense and bringing to mind a field of spiritual figures. Some of you in the room perhaps are not Buddhist. I was just speaking as if everybody was Buddhist, but maybe some of you are Christian. So you might bring to mind God or Christ or Mary or the communion of saints. Or some of you may be Hindu and you might bring to mind divine figures or divinities of Hinduism that are part of your own community's tradition. And so also for Islam, Confucianism, and so forth, indigenous religion. That would be a field, a spiritual field. Is that clear? But that'll only work as an actual access point to these qualities if it does, if there's a felt sense that you have when you bring that to mind. If you do not really have a strong felt sense, don't beat yourself up about it. That's what I'm trying to help with. We can find a different access point which will help the mind understand that the spiritual field practice is like another access point that you do have access to. For example, just remember one simple moment of caring connection. A moment, and this is the key, a moment that makes you happy to recall. Now let me ask you do, you, do you have any moments in your entire life? Any moments, one moment that makes you happy to recall? Which was a moment of connection? Don't tell me you don't. I understand if you don't feel that you have, that's called an attachment script. Again, this is coming from a part of psychology. In our childhood, we may have had a difficult childhood in the sense that we did not feel like we had reliable care and love as a small child, even as an infant. And so in our formation from childhood, we may have developed what's called an attachment script. All of us have an attachment script, but a kind of attachment script, a kind of internal script of expectations around relations to others, such as I am not lovable and no one could ever love me and no one ever has, or um, there is no such thing as love, actually. People pretend to love, but they don't really care, right? Those are attachment scripts. They feel as if they are simply reality. They're not reality. In fact, all of us have had many moments of caring connection, but we may be caught up in an attachment script that developed in our childhood, a kind of a script for what anything can mean to us, which says there are no caring moments even though there are, and we have experienced them, we cannot remember them. We cannot notice them. We cannot see them. That's an attachment script that is, the attachment scripts are all kinds. This is a certain kind that prevents us from noticing that even right now, somebody in this room may be holding you in care and kindness 
and you cannot notice that. So then you may declare, well, I've never had a caring moment. No one's ever cared about me, even as you're declaring that to someone who's caring about you, but you cannot see it. Is that clear? So attachment scripts are operating through parts of ourself, senses of self, which have that pattern of thought and feeling. It feels very, very real. The mind's completely identified with it. But we can learn to become freer. We can. It's just that we have to want to. We have to really want to. Or there's no way that our mind will be willing because it doesn't want to enough to unblend, to relax, to hold the sense of self and its feeling in deep acceptance. The mind simply will not do that because it doesn't want to enough yet. So we have to really want to. So I'm suggesting it might be a good thing to really want to. And that's a part of what's called renunciation, to really want to become free, to really want that, to be tired of going on the way that we have, to be really exhausted with that, to really want to be free. That's renunciation, nijung in Tibetan, nisarana in Sanskrit. It's a key to the path. Is that sort of clear? Okay, so there are alternative points of access to innate qualities from our fundamental awareness. We could bring to mind a spiritual field, like a refuge field, a communion of saints or whatever, field of your ancestors. Could be bringing to mind a person that you're grateful has been in your life. That's really a way of also constructing your own, really uncovering your own spiritual field. Bring to mind someone you're grateful has been in your life or your world. Or another accident, and then you'll start to experience qualities of care, love, compassion, or uplift, or inspiration. Then a part of the mind might arise, may very well arise, that says, no, this isn't happening. No, I don't believe that there's real, you know, I don't believe this is really happening. Oh, this is just my imagination. And then we can sort of, we can actually notice, oh, that's what John means by a part of oneself arising. Not just, oh yes, I obey. You're absolutely right, part of, <laughs> part, or sense of self. Yes, of course, I obey. You're absolutely right. This must be my imagination. I have to worry for the next 10 minutes. Of course we can go that way. That's our habit. But we don't actually have to. There could actually be a recognition. Oh, that's what John meant. This is a sense of self arising. Aha, what do I do? So then, what do we do? What do we do when we notice a sense of self coming up with a feeling, strong feeling maybe? Oh, this is just my imagination, this can't be real. Even though I'm experiencing the innate qualities, boom, a part just sort of shuts it down. What do we do? Oh, that's a sense of self, that's what John meant. So now what do we do? You tell me, please. What? So Peter says, so just become aware of it in a deeply accepting way. Sort of gently welcoming it. A sense that with regard to that sense of self, you have a right to be here. You know that. You're welcome to be here. That already, even in having that relation to it, the mind is no longer caught up in it. It's welcoming it. And then that sense of self, that part of us, can begin to relax, feel more safe with us, begin itself to experience these innate qualities. That sense that you are welcome is already one of those innate qualities. Some warmth, acceptance, gentle care. Care for rather than fear, aversion, or identification with. Is that clear to everybody? What do we do? Just become aware of it in a deeply accepting way. 
gently welcoming way, letting it share in these qualities, whatever qualities we're experiencing. We named many of them the other day. That's why I asked you to name them. You cannot deny that there are such qualities being experienced in this room because you named about 20 of them. So just let this sense of self, this part of you, be encompassed in whatever of those qualities you're experiencing, you're feeling. Is that clear? In a sense, the principle of this is so simple, and yet it's not necessarily easy, and our mind needs to really want to learn it, or it simply will not. And it's wanting to learn it is part of what renunciation means. I really would like a different way of being. Okay. So another access point besides spiritual field or person that you're grateful has been in your life or world is a caring moment. A moment that makes you happy to recall with another human being or an animal. Or it could be a special place that's special to you. Maybe a part of you is simply demanding, I, I'm sorry, no humans, no animals, <laughs> nothing, no caring moments. I've never had any. <laughs> so animals too. I don't care how cute the puppy or kitten is. Forget it. <laughs> I never snuggled with one. I never will. I hate animals, including human animals. Okay, so that's a part of you. So... How about a special place? Has there ever been anywhere that you've ever been that you felt safe, deeply okay, maybe like inconceivably? Oh, like you're sitting on a hillside at sunset overlooking a beautiful sunset and it just comes over you, a profound okayness, inexplicable. How can everything be okay? I've been worrying my whole life and every, all earlier today, just worrying and worrying and worrying, suddenly it just feels deeply okay. How could that be? Then re-inhabit that place at that moment. That's another access point. Or it could be a caring moment with yourself as the caring figure for another and then experiencing the qualities that are evoked within that moment. Or it can be as direct as simply becoming compassionately aware of your feelings and thoughts, your sense of self, just becoming compassionately aware of it, aware of it in a deeply accepting way. It could be done in that direct way. And for some people that may be the actually easier. Okay. Having said all that, there are parts of us, as I said, that are protecting us from this kind of vulnerability, this kind of receptivity to these innate qualities, even to love and compassion and wisdom, because these parts of us think, and these parts of us all think this, that those innate qualities come only from other beings, other persons and things. All these parts of us have long thought and still think, doesn't matter what I'm saying now, those parts of us, those parts of you do not believe me. I know that. I'm trying to assure them it's okay somehow anyway, even though you don't believe me, these parts of everybody. These parts of us think that the capacities and qualities, experience of love, compassion, wisdom, and so forth, warmth, acceptance, come to us from others. And so we're dependent on others to give us those qualities and experiences. And so these parts of us arose starting mostly in childhood to try to strategize how to get people and things to give us those qualities or to avoid being hurt by others because we're dependent on them entirely to get these qualities from them. So if they turn away from us, we're going to be hurt because we can't get to these qualities any other way but through them. So parts of us, protective parts of us have arisen since childhood that are still operative in us as if we are still children of that age and totally control us. 
And the big mistake these parts of us are making is to think that those qualities come from outside of us. They think that for an obvious reason, that from the time we were infants onward, it seemed that when someone was present to us in a loving, caring way, that then we were experiencing loving qualities. What we didn't understand, but which the Buddha's teaching discloses, is that that's true. We are dependent on other people, especially as infants and small children, to be present to us in a caring way. We need that as human beings. But that's not because they give us the, quali the qualities of love and compassion and so forth that we're experiencing. It's because when they embody those qualities, it resonates with our innate capacity and evokes it. It brings it out of us. It causes it to manifest. They're not giving us these experiences of love and compassion and warmth and care and tenderness. They don't give it to us. No one has ever given us that experience. They have evoked that experience from our own awareness. Is that clear? This is part of the Buddha's teaching. This is what no one has known in our ordinary lives because the parts of us have been in charge and the parts of us do not know it. They still think that these qualities only come from others or from just the right circumstances. I have to take a vacation somewhere in order to feel good. Otherwise, I can't feel good. I can't just take a vacation right here and now. It has to be in, I used to say Bermuda until it was devastated by a hurricane recently, tragically. But you understand what I mean. Therefore, these parts of us are trying to protect us from being hurt by controlling how vulnerable or receptive we become to love and compassion itself. If we become too receptive to love and compassion, these parts feel, we're becoming vulnerable to getting hurt. So they will not let us get too receptive, too vulnerable to them. They will jump up and they'll say, time to think about other things, John. Or time to worry about something. Or time to think, this is just imagination, this can't be real, even if I'm experiencing those qualities. Suddenly a part of me will come up. Time to ignore these qualities. It won't be thinking that way. It simply will ignore them and declare, you know, something else that's really important to think about. Not just settling more and more into the felt sense of these qualities. That's not what we should be doing, John. We should be doing lots of other things. <laughs> So these parts of us are protective parts. They're actually trying to help, but they don't understand that what we're doing is learning how to access qualities that are innate to us. So they keep trying to protect us by shutting down our access to these qualities. They don't feel ready to open more fully. So how to help them feel ready? And that becomes three principles of the receptive mode. Accessing, noticing, and including. We begin with our best access point. Here in leading the meditation, I can't really lead all the different access points. But you can find your own and just settle into it. I'll lead basically a meditation on a caring moment or bringing to mind your spiritual field. But you can find your own access point. It could be a special place or it could be... Certainly a caring moment could be with a pet or animal or however it works for you. And that means accessing qualities. We actually start to experience a felt sense of warmth or acceptance or love or compassion or uplift or the qualities you all named two nights ago. That's accessing. The next thing is noticing when a part of us, a sense of self, jumps up with associated feeling and wants to think about other things or take control in some way. So that's noticing becoming, be noticing it. By noticing it already, the mind's not completely sucked into it. And then comes the important third principle. What were the first two principles again? Thank you. So accessing and noticing. And then the third principle, including. 
So including that part of yourself, that sense of self and its feelings in this compassionate space of these basically loving qualities. Or another way to phrase it is, within this compassionate space of re-inhabiting a caring moment as if it's happening now, or having a sense that your spiritual field is really, really here and holding you, within that compassionate space with its qualities, let this part of yourself, this sense of self and its feelings, be included. Let it be held in those loving qualities. Or another way to say it, just be become, in this compassionate space, become aware of it in a deeply accepting way, gently welcoming way. That's accessing the innate qualities, noticing the part of us that jumps up and says, sorry, you're becoming vulnerable to something that might hurt you because these qualities only come from other people and sometimes they don't cooperate. So I'm shutting this down. Time to feel anxiety or something. <laughs> <laughs> so then that brings in the second principle, noticing that. Noticing that that's a sense of self, that's a part of oneself. And that has feelings. And then comes the third principle. What was that again? The third principle? Including. including. What does that mean? So including that sense of self and its feelings in this compassionate space, letting it be encompassed by these caring qualities, deeply accepting, allowing it. And then our mind is no longer blended with it, no longer fully identified with it, and now we're starting to inhabit our fuller awareness, which can hold any part of us that may come up in care without being sucked into it. And when we begin to learn that, that's the beginning of learning how to be with others, how to be with them and their feelings in a way that isn't caught up in our own reactions. Because we can be present to any of our reactions in a deeply compassionate way. And then automatically we're already present to others and their feelings with the same compassion. There's no boundary there. If we can't be present to our own feelings and reactions in a deeply compassionate, accepting way, then we cannot be that way with others because others will trigger our feelings. They will trigger our senses of self and feelings as reactions. They will do that. And we, don't know how to, we won't know how to be with our own feelings and therefore you don't know how to be with them, with others. Is that clear? So by digging pretty deep here into the receptive mode, and that in the releasing phase, the phase where I say, okay, now just settle really deeply into this sense of, this felt sense of love or care or acceptance and let that help your mind to kind of trust and relax, let go of its frameworks and just fall gently, completely open and just let this kind of unity of total openness and awareness meditate you. That's the deepening mode and that's the final phase of every meditation. You can listen for that. So we're already being introduced to the receptive mode. There are three modes of practice. Receptive mode, becoming receptive to the innate qualities of love, compassion, and wisdom, and so forth. The deepening mode, which is le learning how those qualities can help our mind learn to trust more in the source of those qualities, in the nature of our mind and begin to relax into the nature of our mind or into the basic openness and clarity and warmth of our fundamental awareness. That's the deepening mode. And then the extending mode is having achieved such depth, having rediscovered what we really are, which is a much fuller awareness and openness than any one part an awareness that transcends identification with any part, having discovered or uncovered that that's what we are, we can come from that depth and relate to others in the depth of their being, which does not stop at the superficial reactions that all our minds have been caught in. Coming from our depth to speak to others in their depth, even if they don't know it yet. That's the extending mode. Is that sort of clear? 
I mean, something like that, anyway. Okay, so let's go ahead and lead uh, the meditation practice in the receptive mode again. And I'm going to, because our time is actually so short, and uh, anyhow, uh, I'll, I'm just going to lead the meditations in a brief way, but you also have the handout and you can revisit them. And the process of learning these practices is actually the way these actually un unfold in life is not by just having been introduced to them one time, of course, but if someone stakes a, takes a really strong interest practicing in this way, I call it sustainable compassion training, you would take the practice that's most connecting for you. You would do it first thing in the morning. It would be your anchor for the day, and you would reconnect with that felt sense of that practice throughout your entire day in many brief moments. If you do that over a period of months, you'll have done it hundreds of thousands of times. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? Doing something 100,000 times? You actually will have done that. This is another way, a complementary aspect, a kind of way of doing mundra, foundational practices. Okay, so we'll begin with abdominal breathing. What do you say? Any objections to that? You know, what can go wrong? So, okay, on the inhale, your, your abdomen, your tummy should expand. Is that happening, everybody? Is your tummy expanding? Can you feel it? If you're not sure, put a hand on your tummy. Feel it expand when you inhale. Then the exhale is relaxed and slow, you know, as slow as you can in a relaxed way. You pause at the end of the exhale, and then inhale with your tummy expanding again. Isn't that nice? This way of breathing will induce a relaxation response if you let it. So try to let it. Let it help us relax in a deep way. And now while continuing to breathe from the abdomen, so your tummy is expanding with each breath, now just let the breath settle into its own, its own natural rhythm. Is that okay? And now you have a choice. You can recall a moment of caring connection that makes you happy to recall or seems meaningful to you. Or you can bring to mind your spiritual field, but only if you really have, that gives you a felt sense of being held and care and compassion and so forth. You choose. So can everybody bring to mind something? I also mentioned other options. If it's a moment of caring connection, then just, or whatever it is, then just re-inhabit that moment as if it's happening now. Really try to imagine that you are there now, or that is here now, in that place, with that being. So you're bringing it to mind, not as a distant memory, but as happening right now. That is how you are being held now, here.
And imagine this person is radiating warmth to you and care, seeing you in your deep worth beyond judgments. And just wishing you deeply well, or however it is. And just relax into the felt sense of this caring moment happening now. Just steeping in its loving energy and tender qualities and letting them infuse your whole being. As if every part of you is loved in its very being. Feel the unconditional quality of this care. If part of you is having difficulty with this practice, then without trying to change it in any way, just become aware of that part of you and what it's feeling in a deeply accepting way within this compassionate space. Just letting it have the space it needs to relax and find its own place here and settle in its own way. Any part of you or sense of self that comes up, just letting it too be held as you are. in simple care. And now just settle deeply into this felt sense of warmth or acceptance or love or however it is and let that felt sense help your heart and mind to trust and just relax deeply and let go of all of its frameworks of mind. And just let the mind fall gently, completely open like space. Letting any patterns of thought and feeling that come up just unwind or, re or release within this total openness of awareness. This space of deep acceptance. And just letting everything be. Okay. And you can see the practice we just did in the handout. It's uh, meditation number two. And there's a little, just a little bit of introduction to it and processing of it there. Don't, actually don't look at it right now. I'm just telling you it's there. I mean, I'm here now, so you don't actually need to use the handout. But when I'm not here, you could use the handout, you know. This, this process of accessing, noticing, and including, accessing innate qualities, noticing whatever part of us comes up that is in one way or another shutting down <laughs> the receptivity to those qualities. 
caught up in some reaction. So somebody yesterday said, well, one difficulty I had was that I found myself grieving for the loss of the person that had been in that caring moment. And that's a very natural human thing, of course. But what I'm suggesting is not to reject that sadness at all. I'm not suggesting that it's wrong to grieve at all. I'm actually suggesting that we can make a space for that felt sense of grief and welcome it. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's how to handle the grief. That's why it's not a problem. So when I asked what difficulties did people have and someone generously shared, well, I was really getting caught up in grief over the loss of the person in that moment. What I'm, ta what I'm suggesting is that does not have to be a difficulty. That can in fact be the basis for evoking more of our innate qualities of acceptance and warmth and welcoming. Not a difficulty, not an obstacle. Nothing is an obstacle in that sense to this meditation if we learn this principle. So accessing the qualities, including whatever parts and feelings come up in those qualities, and then, you know, having noticed them. So those are the three principles, accessing, noticing, including. This process is experienced by these various parts of us once they become familiar with it, once they realize we're serious, we're actually going to allow them to be here. We're not going to suppress or deny or avoid them, even though we're not getting sucked up in them. Once these parts of us realize that, they start to feel really safe with us. Oh, actually, that's what we were trying to do all along is get these qualities, and here they are. So actually, we could just relax and do these qualities that we've been trying so hard to get and to keep because we thought they were coming from others. So John or Sally or Billy or Sanam or whoever it is seems to be being with us in a way that the qualities are here that we've been trying to get for so long. And once they begin to realize that, and that requires us learning how to really be that, that way with them, aware of them in a deeply accepting way, not trying to change them. Once these parts of us realize that that's what we're doing, they do start to relax. Oh, you know, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I've been working so hard to try to protect you and get these qualities for you and keep away whatever will prevent these qualities. I'm exhausted. I need to rest. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a vacation. These parts actually start to feel that way. They may not talk that way, but that's the felt sense, and that's deeply healing. That means they begin to relax, and it really feels like they're starting to heal these old wounded parts of us. So this, this process is a deeply healing process. There's another, some other aspects of it I just want to point out really quick because then I'm going to lead a short other practice and then we'll close. You will notice in how I led it and when you look at the handout, which is not now but later, you will notice that this practice starts with whatever qualities of our awareness, love, compassion, etc., whatever qualities are evoked by that moment of caring connection or by bringing to mind a spiritual field or by thinking of a special place or by bringing to mind a moment when I was a caring figure for someone else, but then these tender qualities come to me. You following? Whatever the access point is, we begin with some experience of these qualities that you all named which is still conditioned and conditional as human beings. Not absolutely unconditional, but the instruction is taking what has arisen, the experience, the felt sense of these qualities, 
and is purifying them into greater and greater unconditionality. It doesn't matter that the experience that we had in that caring moment was not completely unconditional. The, maybe the person we were with was loving, but they're still a human being. And, you know, if we do the wrong thing, they won't be quite so loving. But anyhow, in that moment, they were really loving. So that's conditional love. That's mostly what we have as human beings, right? So someone might say, but then we're, all we're doing is accessing conditional qualities. So that's true. Initially, what we're accessing are conditioned and conditional qualities, but the instruction takes that and then purifies it into greater and greater unconditionality. Like as if every part of you is loved in its very being. So loved in its very being means that no matter what, you are loved. No matter what you have ever done, ever thought, or ever will do, you are loved in your very being, in the depth of your being. And that's unconditional and unconditioned, and nothing can change it. So that's, that's part of what a Buddha is. Remember, I did my PhD research, and what are Buddhas exactly? What are their qualities? You can look that up. It's a book called Buddhahood Embodied Now. So anyhow, I did some research on this. That's part of what a Buddha is. That's part of what enlightenment or awakening is. It's an unconditioned, because it's an expression of unconditioned wisdom, it's literally an unconditioned power of care, compassion, love, acceptance, which cannot be changed. But that doesn't mean that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are always huggy-wuggy. <laughs> it can sound like that. But love doesn't just hug. It sometimes does do that. You may have noticed. Even, you know, llamas hug people and animals. You may have seen that. But love doesn't just hug wug, if that's a verb. <laughs> love is also always sorry, confronting. Confronting whatever it is that is harmful to the one who is loved. So this is actually, this is not unfamiliar to us. This is what mature parents need to do with their children. Out of love for the child, you have to sometimes confront the child on behalf of the child, not on behalf of other people who are being hurt by the child, on behalf of the child. Uh, it, sorry, no, there will be no more time today for computer or smartphone. And I'm doing that for you, although it doesn't feel that way to you at all, child. <laughs> you know, you understand? This is also true of therapists, nurses, not just psychotherapists, but physical therapists and social workers. Love or care, genuine care, also confronts. Confronts whatever it is in a person for whom you care that's preventing them from being well. Confronting that in them, not on behalf of others against them, but on behalf of them. Is that clear? And that's also the quality of the Buddha's love and compassion. That's why it's not just huggy-wuggy, but it's real love and compassion. It's willing to take the reactions that we have to being confronted. Like, for example, the declaration that we're going to need renunciation. We're going to need to really want to be free to learn how to disidentify, to learn how to unblend. We're going to need, really want, need to want that or it will not happen. So you, you heard the firmness in my voice. So that's kind of like a gentle confronting. This is just sort of an example. So 
So I'm not comparing myself to like high llamas and things like that. I'm just trying to give some kind of concrete example so we have some sense of it. Okay? Okay, so clear enough. The second thing is now obvious. The mind through this process is learning that it does not have to be totally identified with any one part of us, any sense of self. I'll repeat that. The mind is actually learning through this process that it does not have to be identified with any sense of self. This is one way of coming at the teaching of no self. It's not that we don't have any senses of self. It's that we have tons. We have multitudes of senses of self. We have no unchanging substantial self. All we have are these transient patterns of thought and feeling. But boy, they feel real. They feel substantial. And it feels as if there's a some, some, there's some actual self in us that's not changing. That's what we're discovering is uh, not there by learning to pay new attention. The second principle, noticing these transient senses of self as they arise and how quickly they can just settle and dissolve because they're impermanent and because they have no substantial reality at all. But don't tell them that. That will upset them, these senses of self. So that's sort of our secret. Okay? So the mind's learning it doesn't have to be totally identified with any sense of self by encompassing each part or each sense of self in the compassion of our fuller awareness that transcends any one part cannot be identified with any one part. Is that clear? Thirdly, we're learning thereby to begin to reunify with our fuller awareness. The fuller awareness that can embrace all parts of us in compassion without being caught up in them the fuller awareness that can also be compassionately present to others without being caught up in the machinations of their minds. We're beginning to learn how to reunify with that fuller awareness, and that especially happens in the releasing phase at the end of the meditation. When the instruction comes, let this help your heart and mind to trust, relax, let go of its frameworks, and just fall completely open like space which is actually the opportunity to discover a space-like quality that pervades our experience and just relax into the, the basic openness or space that's already here. That's the releasing phase or the final phase of the meditation we just did. And that's what I'm calling deepening mode to begin to release the frameworks and reference points of the mind. But the mind will not do that unless it trusts what it's letting go into and the qualities of love and compassion and warmth and acceptance help the mind trust the source of those qualities which the mind cannot conceptually understand. But it still, it trusts those qualities so it can learn to trust the source of them and just let go into that source which is the basic openness or basic space, ying, and clarity, salwa, and warmth, pervasive fundamental warmth, tujje kunkab, of our fundamental awareness. That's deepening out which initially is probably some level of shamatha that we can settle into as we learn. But it can even deepen into a glimpse of recognition of nature of mind, usually with some help from some other practices or from deep devotion or profound compassion that can just sort of begin to break the mind open. So as I said, the kind of meditation we just did and all the meditations in the handout, whatever stage we're at, the way they work is just what I said before, that we do it first thing in the morning, whatever one is most connecting or what, what we're really focusing on. And then we reconnect with it briefly, the felt sense of it many times in the day, again and again and again. And over a period of months, that becomes thousands and thousands of times. 
and that can begin to transform things. And in neuroscience terms, that's called retraining the brain. It requires a lot of repetition. So again, as with many things, there's a wisdom within Tibetan tradition. Uh, you do certain practices 100,000 times. It's not to torture us. It is from a, also from another perspective. It's retraining our brain and sorry, but that's actually what's required to retrain our brain. What does that mean? It means that there are certain neural connections that are being strengthened by repetition. Repeated behaviors of mind and body strengthen the neural connections involved in those activities, those behaviors. But it takes a lot of repetition. Okay, so we have a few minutes left and uh, what I suggest is that just in our own place, in your own best way, that we stretch for a moment. I mean, I don't know about you, but I need that. So some part of me is coming up that says that that's really needed. You're helping me. I find this a really effective way of stretching, but it may look <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> uh, you do your own way. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit more into the deepening mode. I know it's kind of late, and it'll just be for a few minutes. What the heck? I know parts of us are probably coming up like mad right about now. When will this be over? It'll be soon. So remember I said that the releasing phase of each meditation, so the meditation we just did, the point at near the very end, where it just said, okay, now just settle very, just settle deeply right into this felt sense of warmth or acceptance or care or love, however it is for you. And when you settle very deeply into it, the mind is sort of, has a natural ability to really trust those qualities. Like if nothing else can be trusted, those qualities can be trusted. The mind can begin to recognize that. And therefore through that begin to trust the source of those qualities, which is the nature of mind which actually is a pervasive openness and clarity and warmth that the conceptual mind cannot comprehend. And therefore, it takes a lot of trust for the conceptual mind to permit itself to let go into its deep nature. Is that clear? Sorry, this is sort of my point of view on it. If there's enough trust, then all the reasons of Manyamaka can really break us open. But if there isn't enough fundamental trust in the mind, in what Madhyamaka or Yogacara or Buddhist philosophy is pointing to, if there isn't enough fundamental trust in, our, in the depth of our own being, which is where those philosophies are pointing, if the mind doesn't trust where they're pointing, it can learn the, all those philosophies, but it's not ready to actually realize them. But if there's enough trust in the mind, that's often fostered through devotional practices, but that's what I'm introducing, a kind of another way of coming in at what's called devotional practice, which is deep receptivity. If there's enough trust in the mind that's been developed, then when you study Madhyamaka or doctrines of no self and things like that in Buddhist philosophy, 
dependent arising, then the mind can catch on. It can actually trust enough to let go into what is being pointed out by Buddhist philosophy. Is that clear? I don't mean you have to agree with it. I just mean, is what I said clear? That's how I think about it. You can decide for yourself how it all is. That means studying Buddhist philosophy is very important, but of itself, it won't be enough. There needs to be a fundamental level of trust. In psychology, attachment theory, a term for this is we need to establish internally a very secure base in order to feel enough trust, enough confidence to explore. And that's actually classical attachment theory. When we're infants and then small children, our mother or our caring figures are helping us to feel loved enough, that we feel welcome enough here, that we develop enough trust in being here and in being who we are, because we're loved, that then we establish an inner secure base that corresponds to the outer secure base of our caring figure, an inner secure base from which we are empowered to really explore our world. So you see little infants who have a very secure attachment running off and meeting people and smiling and saying hi, and then they run back to their mother, and then they go off and they explore again, and then they come back to their mother. So the mother's the outer secure base, and they're exercising the possibility of developing an inner secure base, the confidence to go out there and say, hi, who are you? I'm Billy. Right? Have you noticed children doing that? That's develop, beginning to develop secure attachment. So in attachment, in psychological terms, one way of describing what I just talked about is the need to establish an inner core of security, an inner secure base that's strong enough that we're confident enough to explore, to explore even into the depth of our being, even right into the nature of mind. And classically, it's devotional practices. It begins with refuge. Without refuge, it's hard to establish that core of security, that trust, that there's something so deeply trustworthy about our very being that we can trust it. It begins with acknowledging that someone else, at least, sees us in the depth of our being and sees it as deeply trustworthy. At least someone else is doing that. That's the Buddha the bodhisattvas or our lineage teachers, that's their job actually, is to see in that way. It's called dagnang, pure perception. To see that there's something deeply trustworthy in us and we can begin to scaffold on that just like an infant scaffolds on their mother. Well, there, maybe there really is something deeply trustworthy in the depth of my being and maybe my mind can trust that enough to let go into the depth of my being, which is the nature of mind. Anyhow, is that sort of clear? Again, you don't have to agree, but that's, I'm just sort of saying. That's how I think about it. Okay? So the releasing phase of all the meditations, as I said, the point at which we just say, well, just let the mind settle into the felt sense of love and care and warmth and acceptance and compassion. So it's the mind can be trusting more and more trusting the ground or the source of those qualities and finally willing to just let go of its frameworks and just settle into or even let the nature of mind, this fundamental openness and clarity and warmth, which is the nature of our fundamental awareness, even let that draw us into unification with it, reunify us with it, even that. So that's deepening mode, deepening into the nature of mind, which initially will probably be some level of shamatha, meaning deepening calm and settling of the mind. Not yet actually formally a recognition of the very nature of mind, but 
getting closer within conceptual mind, getting closer and closer to what is actually non-conceptual. So the next meditation, that was the beginning of deepening mode, that releasing phase of the meditation we did. The next meditation just goes a little further into the deepening mode. I'm going to call it the meditation of letting be in body, breath, and mind. So letting be within our experience of the body, the breath, and the mind, which can help us to settle even more directly into the depth of our being, which is the unity of space and clarity and warmth and simplicity, which is actually our most natural state, Neluk. So we'll just do that in very brief, just a few minutes. What the heck, right? Why not? We have a few minutes anyway. Why not kill time? <laughs> Interesting expression. Actually, I guess that's what we're up to, isn't it? Killing time. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, sort of gently demolishing the frameworks of mind that construct the whole felt sense of time and space. I don't want to get into all that, but just, I just thought of that. Killing time actually has a meaning. <laughs> okay, sorry, we should be serious. So, do a little abdominal breathing. Abdomen expanding on the inhale. Slow, relaxing exhale with a pause at the end. So you're breathing from the abdomen. You can just let the conceptual mind or the thinking mind just be pulled right into the abdomen with the inhale. And then let your attention just settle into the feeling of the body as a whole. And notice any feeling of tightness or holding on within the body. And just try to let that relax to whatever extent you can, just letting bodily feelings settle in their own way. So deeply letting be in the body, into the body deeply letting be. As if letting the body draw you into oneness with it. As if letting the body meditate you. And now while still breathing from the abdomen, and feel the abdomen expand and contract with each breath, that aspect of your body. Feeling the abdomen expand and contract through the whole inhale and exhale. And notice any sense of holding on to the breathing process and let that relax. And just deeply let be into the bodily feeling of the breath. Letting the feeling of the breath draw you into oneness with it. like letting the breath meditate you.
And now within the mind, notice any sense of self, any holding on to a sense of self in the mind or to a thought or framework of mind. And let that feeling of holding on within the mind just relax deep within. giving the heart and mind permission to just fall gently, totally open. Letting the mind reunite with the natural openness that's already here beyond reference points. And let this total openness of awareness meditate you. Let this total openness and awareness Meditate you. Let it do the meditating. And let patterns of experience that arise, thoughts or feelings, just unwind or release within this natural space of total openness and deep acceptance. Letting everything be. So that practice of three letting bees is kind of the central practice of the deepening mode. Remember, there are three modes of practice for this kind of training, receptive mode, deepening mode, extending mode. So that was at the core of the deepening mode. And through bodily awareness and breath awareness, the mind can settle so deeply that when it comes to the deep letting be of mind, the mind has the opportunity, if there's enough inner readiness, to settle so deeply that it can begin to revert to its most natural state, which is the unity of emptiness and clarity and compassionate energy. Or if not that, the mind can settle into a deepening level of shamatha without support, as it's called. settling into the basic openness of clarity or cognizance, which is not yet the mind reverting to its most natural state, 
it's not yet a, uh, an actual recognition of nature of mind, of emptiness and clarity. But on the clarity aspect of things, it's getting pretty deep. It can settle pretty deeply and settle into what's called a state of shamatha without support, that is deep calm. A deep calm by resting in the natural openness of cognizance or clarity which is still subtly conceptual, Gesundheit, as we say in Germany. Still subtly conceptual, still a sense of meditating on something, but it's getting about, it can get about as close as the conceptual mind can get to the non-conceptual nature of mind. So that's the direction of deepening. And the receptive mode can help that by helping the mind to trust that which is the ground or source of the qualities that it's beginning to access in the receptive mode. So is that kind of clear? That's actually all I intended to cover tonight. So we have two and a half minutes left. Yeah, is there any danger? Yeah, there could be a danger. So could, could there be a danger of settling into a, a nyam, which is kind of... Um, I guess Eric has translated that as like a meditation mood. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a, a felt sense of bliss or uh, beyond thought or beyond thinking um, or uh, clarity or glimpses of kinds of insight that are sort of breaking out. Could there be a danger of sort of settling into that and getting attached to that? And of course, yes, there is a danger. Um, and it's a bit of a trick. I still have, you know, I still have a minute and a half. It involves some navigating. Suppose the room is a room full of nurses and whatever. Well, then I would assume that by and large, there are two groups in this room, people in caring professions, obviously, because they're all nurses. And probably a good percentage of them, from my experience, have some spiritual tradition that's part of the reason they got into nursing. So where I'm going with this is basically the possibility of settling into some level of shamatha. And when you settle into some level of shamatha, you have settled into um, something that is not yet really uh, deeply freed, including uh, the the kind of meditative state, you know, uh, associated, what do we call them? I'm not, I don't really like meditation moods, you know, but yeah, sort of special experiences. Is there, you may settle into that, but that's establishing for someone who's not going down the full Buddhist path enough of an, in, of an inner secure base that from there they can go into the extending mode. They can be present to others in a way that knows how to access innate qualities and can find replenishment in that and a kind of sustaining power in that can come back to our access and come from that to be with others. And that's all I'm shooting for with people who are not going down a full Buddhist path. But in this room, there are probably a fair number of Buddhists. And so... I'm sort of exploring the opportunity that it could also go further than that. So we could say there's the possibility of an outer secure base, which is like a teacher or the Buddha or when we were infants, our mother. And that's also or like outer refuge. And then there's the possibility of establishing an inner secure base, which is like inner refuge, really accessing the qualities and insights and freedoms beginning. So inner secure base. And then there's what I would call ultimate secure base. And that's uh, reunification with the nature of mind itself. That's the mind reverting to its most natural state. And that's not something I shoot for when the room's composed of, the first of those two groups and not Buddhists. But it is something we can shoot for as Buddhists. So it sort of depends on who's in the room. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, like that. That's why I said I'm now asking this as a Buddhist. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. So I'm for and sticking with yeah. the uh, meditative experience of bliss. Right. Since there's such an emphasis on sort of feeling good. Right. And so well. in the individual discussions that ensue, yeah. if there are Buddhists, then we get into it. Mm -hmm. 
So could there be a getting caught up in uh, sort of a sense of self reacting to that uh, special experience? We can talk about that and we can explore further. And there could be practices that could be introduced for a Buddhist, like insight practices, vipassana practices, guru yoga practices, ngundra practices, vajrayana practices, studying Buddhist philosophy. We could actually go to the shedra. That's the sort of thing we can do with Buddhists. It doesn't stop here. This becomes like a doorway into whatever's needed. That happens in discussion. Sort of like speaking to you as a Buddhist. Thank you, Shireen. So that's the end of our time. Thank you all. <laughs> so I'll be at lunch again one more time. That'll be tomorrow. Uh, not Friday, I'm afraid. Some other obligation came up. So tomorrow.